Thank you very much to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the Centres of Asia Pacific Excellence, which of course includes the Southeast Asia, North Asia and Latin America Capes, and the Ministry of Defence. And thank you also to the supporting partner, the Asia New Zealand Foundation. We would now like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Kurt Campbell, who the Prime Minister referred to earlier, Deputy Assistant to the President and the National Security Council Coordinator for the Indo-Pacific in the current Biden administration. It is a new role within the National Security Council. He formerly served as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs in the Obama administration. And prior to re-entering government service, Kurt was chair and CEO of the Asia Group and has been dubbed an Asian czar by some commentators who note that there is no American who knows more about Asia and is better known in Asia than him. He also has a strong connection to New Zealand. Kurt was in Christchurch during the 2011 earthquake, along with other US Congress people at the New Zealand US Partnership Forum. And in the 2014 New Year's Honours was made an honorary companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to New Zealand US relations. And just a reminder, please do submit your questions uh, for Kurt using Slido, and we will aim to get through more of them this time than we were able to with the Prime Minister. Welcome, Dr. Kurt Campbell. Thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, frankly, it's my honor to be with you all today, and I'm incredibly grateful to follow the Prime Minister. Um, there are few leaders on the international stage that we in the United States look to with more admiration and we're incredibly grateful for the leading role that she plays on uh, so many different things and I just wanted to indicate to all of you she did a wonderful uh, presentation uh, a few weeks ago at the uh, Council on Foreign Relations I don't know and I think can, Sarah, can, can everyone hear me? We can now. We've missed uh, the beginning of your address. Apologies. Okay, I'm so sorry. Is is that is it is that okay now? I'm sorry. Yeah, perfect. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I apologize. Let me just begin and just say again, it's an honor and a thrill to be with you all today. Uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to to address you directly and to particularly to follow the Prime Minister. Prime Minister Arden is is deeply, highly regarded here in the United States. Um, she's a leader that inspires us. Um, who has done a magnificent job on so many issues from extremism to dealing with critical issues like climate change. She encourages us to focus more on critical issues in the Pacific and Asia. And frankly, we are extremely uh, hopeful. We're ambitious for the next phase in the relationship between the United States and New Zealand. So I'm grateful for the chance to be with you today. I'm just gonna say a couple of things, and then I'd be more than pleased to take any questions or comments as we go forward. So let me just say that the United States understands that um, from the period going forward, the lion's share of the history of the 21st century is going to be written in the Indo-Pacific. And our objective will be to ensure that as we go forward, that the operating system, and that's a loose description of the things that fit together in a complex way, freedom of navigation, issues associated with trade, with our foreign employed engagement with allies and partners, the rule of law, all of those things taken together have given us over the last 40 or 50 years the most important progress on the planet in history. And our goal as we deal with a more complex region going forward is to ensure that elements of that operating system remain intact, that it's negotiated carefully among participant nations if there need to be adjustments, and that we uh, maintain elements of free and open Indo-Pacific, and that those characteristics remain dominant as we go forward. I think we know and we all acknowledge that there are challenges to that system. Um, we are concerned by uh, recalcitrant North Korea, a country that, that uh, uh, still uh, demonstrates its nuclear ambitions. Uh, we're concerned by some elements of Chinese uh, uh, power and uh, uh, some of its aspirations in the Indo-Pacific. We're concerned by uh, regional tensions in a variety of places. We're worried about setbacks in uh, democracy, in uh, uh, fledgling uh, countries uh, like uh, Burma, Myanmar. And we look uh, more generally at a region that will uh, be called on to play 
uh, a critical role if we're to address issues like climate change, like uh, uh, combating the pandemic in an effective way. So what the Biden administration is trying to do in a complex way is to respond to the current challenges. And I will tell you all, New Zealand friends, the most important ingredient in a successful strategy is for the United States to respond domestically. And I think we all understand that in many respects, the United States has been wounded, that there are elements of our democracy that have been challenged, that the coronavirus has been extremely difficult here as it has been elsewhere, and that the president has insisted that the most important ingredient in our overall strategy is to recover domestically and also to focus on our economic revival and where possible to try to heal some of the divisions that have become so apparent in our own country and that were on full display on January 6th. So the primary focus of the initial period of the Biden administration has been on engaging domestically. Uh, at the same time, we are also focused on working closely with allies and friends. And you will have seen that in deep discussions in Europe, the president's initial diplomacy across Europe, including uh, with the G7, G11, and also more recently with engagements, bilateral engagements with countries like Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, and also the fledgling initial effort of the Quad, the uh, uh, pairing of the United States, Japan, Australia, uh, and India as part of an effort to bring together democracies with an interest in the maintenance of peace and stability across the region as a whole. I will say that we are uh, uh, thrilled by the initial diplomacy and engagement that we've had uh, with New Zealand. Uh, that will continue later this week. Uh, I believe we will engage uh, closely and deeply on APEC. Uh, we also uh, are looking forward to hosting a visiting delegation here in Washington, D.C. Uh, from New Zealand. Uh, we are involved in strategic discussions about every element of our shared approach uh, to the region and to the world, and we're grateful for the deep partnership, frankly, with Wellington. I expect that over the next little while, we'll, we will be talking um, intensively about our shared perspective of challenges and opportunities uh, in Asia. We will talk more about the Pacific and some of the challenges that the Pacific faces in terms of health, uh, matters related to climate change, the health of, uh, of the fishing stocks, a number of different things that we think will be critical um, uh, uh, in our bilateral relationship as we go forward. So I just want to say, having worked closely on New Zealand for decades, I'm extremely ambitious about what we can accomplish together. I'm grateful for the partnership that we share on so many issues. Um, the United States, as you know, recently joined the Christchurch Initiative, which we believe was an extraordinarily effective mechanism to explore the root causes of extremism uh, online and in all of our societies. So I just want to say that it's my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I don't want to go on too long. Uh, I'd rather take your questions more generally. But um, I, I do want to just say that in the United States, there are so many admirers of uh, New Zealand. And uh, frankly, uh, in many respects, even during our dark periods and our challenging times, we look to New Zealand for inspiration uh, and for motivation, both as uh, a model for how we can uh, go about our own democracy, but also for your uh, leading role in international relations, global politics, and particularly in the Indo-Pacific. So um, more to follow. Uh, we uh, are excited about what we can accomplish economically, strategically, politically, militarily, and uh, across a number of existential issues like climate change. I'll stop there, and I would be more than pleased to take any questions or comments. Thank you all very much.
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Campbell, for that address. Uh, we've got a lot of questions here, so I'll try, we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. I'll start with the, uh, the top rated question here, which is about, uh, asks, what is the Biden administration's long-term strategy when dealing with rising threats in the Indo-Pacific? And what are the key indicators or signs that New Zealand should look for that the strategy is succeeding going forward? Well, look, I, I do want to underscore that our ultimate goal is the maintenance of peace and stability in Asia. The United States does not seek a new Cold War. We do not seek uh, a, uh, a harmful or deleterious uh, competition with China. What we are seeking is a stable relationship. We recognize that a dominant feature of that relationship will be competition, but we believe that competition can often bring out the best in countries and people, and that's what we're seeking to do. We recognize that the dominant arenas of that competition are likely to be in technology, in things like 5G, in AI, artificial intelligence, robotics, quantum computing, human sciences. And so we, we are putting in place strategies that seek to magnify and amplify our own capabilities, but at the same time, restrict certain engagements that we feel undermine our national strengths. And I do wanna say uh, specifically, uh, we are uh, seeking to work with partners. Now this is a non-political uh, event and it looks to us, frankly, as we're sitting here, that you're having a lot more fun than we are here. But I will say the difference that you will see, I believe, in the Biden administration from the previous Trump administration is that we will seek to do things more with partners. And we recognize that the only way we can be effective globally is to work more generally and creatively and strategically with partners. And so you're going to hear a lot more about the United States working not only with countries that are involved in Five Eyes, but also uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, and other countries in Southeast Asia. And we believe that New Zealand has an absolutely critical role to play. I don't think there is another country, I'm trying to search my mind, that, that potentially punches so far above its weight uh, as New Zealand. I do not believe that there will be, you know, the, the things to look for uh, in the Indo-Pacific will be the level of diplomacy, the determination to work peacefully, to uh, try to ensure that there is a degree of transparency on strategy. Those are all things that we will be seeking. Um, and I believe that over time that you will see that the pieces of our strategy are designed to ensure uh, a, a fulsome engagement from all partners and not to have the region dominated by any uh, one country as we go forward. Thank you very much. You talked a lot about the Quad. How important is the Quad to Indo-Pacific security? And would you encourage New Zealand to deepen engagement with the Quad? Yeah, thank you. So, so I, I would say at, at the current time, what we believe is most important about the Quad is that it is practical and that it offers solutions and options for countries, that it is not some new NATO or some kind of military alliance, but instead a practical association of maritime democracies that are committed to a common vision on many fronts. So you will note that the first uh, uh, gathering of the virtual quad, and we will have one in person later this year, but the first virtual gathering, the big initiative that was announced was uh, a four-way effort to increase the production capacity in India to produce vaccine to the number of 1 billion for ASEAN in 2020, late 2021 and 2022. We stand by that commitment, we're proud of it, and that is an indication of practical work the, of the kind that we want to do going forward. I've said publicly and others have that we have some ambitions to do some things in infrastructure, building on what President Biden announced in Europe in the Build Back Better World. And we will be uh, working closely with our partners going forward. I believe <clears throat> that over time that it will be possible and indeed valuable 
if we think about having associations that might be described friends of the Quad, in which countries that are particularly interested in some of the working groups and work that is being uh, undertaken on cybersecurity, on maritime, on uh, humanitarian relief, you name it, that there are opportunities for like-minded and other states to join in. I can think of no other partner that I'd like to see uh, involved more than New Zealand. I think we intend to keep New Zealand closely briefed. We're at early stages in the actual quad. This is the first actual in-person leaders meeting. And so we have to walk before we can run. So the formal and fundamental engagement is to ensure that the four partners are aligned. But over time, this is not an exclusive club. It is not in any way meant to uh, uh, deny entry to other nations that want to lend a helping hand on efforts like how to deal with the pandemic, like how to grapple with climate change, how to deal with infrastructure. There will be seats and room at the table as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Kurt, there, are, there have been a few questions about trade. So, and I, I do want to ask, um, you have said in the past uh, that RCEP was a wake up call for the US. And I know that you are a veteran of TPP. Uh, so what steps do you think would be necessary to see the US back in the regional trade game? Yeah, thank you. And we acknowledge that the economic piece of our strategy is of critical importance. And you're going to see elements of that. As I mentioned, the Build Back Better World initiative has in it some specifics around how to step up our uh, work on infrastructure. Um, we're exploring a number of things that we can do with respect to economic engagement on climate change. But at the same time, we underscore and understand clearly that trade is the lifeblood of Asia and that countries in the region look at the United States to have an open, engaged, optimistic um, stance with respect to trade engagements in the region. I've said uh, publicly before uh, that, you know, we're exploring a lot of different things. Uh, it's still early days. I think, you know, one of those things is some engagement on digital. It's too early to talk about details, but I do want to underscore that we in the Biden administration understand the significance of this in the region and a desire for the United States to play an active role. It's hard to say this, but I'd ask for a degree of patience and a recognition of some of the challenges that we face. And I think the president has indicated that he wants to be a full partner across uh, the full spectrum of issues in the Indo-Pacific. Indo and so I would simply say you're going to have to watch this space as we go forward. Thank you. We'll look forward to that. <laughs> There's a, uh, our Prime Minister spent a long time talking about the importance of the Pacific and regional architecture like the Pacific Islands Forum. And there's a question here that says, in light of the decision of the five Micronesian nations to withdraw from the Pacific Islands Forum, what impact will this have on US interests in the Pacific and the stability of the WCPO second island chain? Yeah, thank you. And if I can just, just underscore again the importance of New Zealand. In all our discussions with your excellent ambassador here, with other uh, New Zealand uh, representatives and diplomats, there is a constant reminder of our role in, uh, in supporting Australia, New Zealand, and other countries in the Pacific. And it is a reminder of our moral, of our strategic, of our historical uh, requirements to engage actively. I would be the, I've spent quite a bit of time in the Pacific. I would be the first to say that the United States has to substantially step up its game uh, in the region. I will tell you that we are deeply engaged right now in diplomacy uh, with New Zealand about how to go about doing that. That means more resources, how we engage our Coast Guards more directly, how we focus on issues associated with, the, uh, with dealing with the pandemic, uh, how we deal with traditional problems of poverty and obesity and health security, the, all those issues on top of climate change and fishing, um, we are addressing directly. I do believe, and I want to be careful here not to, you know, involve in the, in the delicate, you know, politics of uh, the Pacific Island nations. We think the, the, the affections from the group, the, the, the walkaways have been 
um, have been troubling and concerning. And I think we'd like very much to be part of an effort to bring countries back together to reconvene consensus among all the island partners to find the best ways that the, the, the problems are so overwhelming, they're so challenging, that we are better off tackling them together and in partnership. And so I think what you will see is the United States trying to work with others carefully, um, encouraging uh, in an effort to try to bring uh, elements of uh, unity back to the Pacific Islands, given the magnitude of what we're facing together. Mm. Uh, we have a great question here from Bryce Wakefield, who is from the Australia Institute of International Affairs. He asks, uh, New Zealand is reluctant to expand the remit of Five Eyes beyond intelligence. Is the US keen to make Five Eyes a platform for broader foreign policy cooperation? And if so, how will the divergence be managed? So look, I, I do want to say that we're very comfortable with the partnership that we've seen in Five Eyes. Um, uh, New Zealand is a partner in excellent standing. We've worked very closely with these countries for years. Five Eyes is only one piece of a much larger strategy in Asia and the world. I think you'll see efforts to try to expand uh, countries, other countries that are participating perhaps on the margins or on the edges of this group more generally, but we're very satisfied and uh, pleased by the engagement of uh, New Zealand in this effort. And in fact, I do not believe there has been any discord in this group whatsoever. It is often the case that New Zealand and the United States have discussions about how we see the world and how we see the Indo-Pacific. They are among the most productive, uh, helpful, um, uh, illuminating discussions that I've had and I continue to have on diplomacy. I would just say that the United States is very satisfied uh, with our engagement uh, with Indonesia bilaterally. And we believe that uh, that uh, New Zealand, excuse me, not uh, New Zealand is a very productive and effective uh, partner in the Five Eyes process. And I expect that will continue as we go forward. Thank you. Um, moving back to trade, we've talked a bit this morning about uh, indigenous inclusion, and there's a question here. How can we ensure more equitable benefits from international trade deals, especially for indigenous populations? So, look, I would say that, frank and frankly, that New Zealand has some of the same concerns about trade that groups in the United States do. So what we find often is that when, when we talk about trade, there are groups in the United States and elsewhere that make the argument, look, trade cannot simply be for the big multinationals, that, that, that any agreement or any initiative must be able to address issues associated with the environment, um, with labor concerns, with uh, disenfranchised populations, and as importantly as anything else, the working class in the United States and elsewhere. That's a very high bar, but it's something that I think together our countries will be able to address. My, my, my view is that we, we need an honest discussion about what's possible going forward and hopefully set parameters out that frankly address trade in a way that um, will build more public support in societies that have frankly suffered in terms of economic dislocation like the United States and other countries. Uh, in Europe more generally. So I, I am of the view that we have to expand not only the results of trades, but the of trade, but the understand, uh, but the the application of it so that that it is not seen as simply serving the interests of the very few, but is broadly um, representative of lifting uh, all peoples up as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, now we have um, the highest rated question here, which I will ask, and it's about Taiwan, which I know is a delicate uh, subject, and it's widely seen as potentially the biggest flashpoint between the US and China. Uh, so there is a question here, why won't the US uh, recognize Taiwan as an independent nation? And I might add to that and ask, what kinds of things should New Zealand be thinking about uh, in terms of the Taiwan Strait? Look, as you can imagine, this is a delicate and sensitive issue, and I'll try to answer carefully. Look, the United States uh, fundamentally, fundamentally believes that the maintenance of the status quo across the Taiwan Straits is in the best interests of all parties, 
Um, we, uh, uh, we support uh, a one-China policy. We do not support Taiwanese independence. But at the same time, we uh, have a strong and we want uh, a thriving relationship, uh, an unofficial relationship between the United States and Taiwan. And we are determined to maintain uh, that peace and stability through careful uh, engagements, uh, through uh, deterrence, uh, through necessary military actions, and through engagements with partners who share our interest in the maintenance of peace and stability. Um, I, I, I do want to underscore that uh, we believe that uh, the last period in uh, over the last uh, 30 or so years, Taiwan's progress has been remarkable. Its democratization, its growth uh, in civil society, um, the, all its many achievements are something that we can be very proud of, and we'd like those to continue in uh, the framework that has been established. Thank you. Uh, sticking with the China theme and a question around motivation. Is the increased influence of the US military advancement in the Indo-Pacific region a move based on the safety and well-being of the Pacific or the suppression of China's military grasp? Look, I, I would just simply say if I can. Um, so if you look at the last 40 years, by almost any measure, um, they have been the best 40 years in China's long, um, uh, illustrious history. Uh, remarkable progress economically, uh, strategically uh, engagement with partners, lifting people out of poverty. And the, the primary uh, ingredient in that has been the hard work and ingenuity of the Chinese people. But it is undeniable that that, that progress took place in a larger framework that the United States was the key architect to help build. So it has been the United States that has created the conditions through which China has seen this remark more remarkable success. So I would just underscore to your questioner that the United States has, in it has indeed taken steps to help facilitate China's growth and progress. And we do not seek uh, to contain or undermine China. What we are seeking instead is for China along with other countries in the Indo-Pacific, continue to adhere to some of the key features of the regional order that have been so productive and effective for all of us. Uh, uh, we believe that there are signs uh, in uh, China's diplomacy and economic uh, activities that are antithetical to some of these um, uh, uh, global norms and values that you see expressed in the Indo-Pacific over the last 30 or 40 years. And so our primary goal with all of our tools, not just our military tools, but our soft power, our partnerships with countries like uh, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, the Quad, is to set the terms for what we hope will be a future that uh, is on a shared vision of peace and prosperity without coercion, uh, without fear or favor uh, in a, a, a world of enormous opportunity going forward. So the United States is not seeking to operate as a hegemon, but more as a convening uh, uh, player, a strategic actor in the region that has an interest, not only for the region as a whole, but for the United States in this larger um, uh, uh, maintenance of peace and stability and uh, uh, an order that has been beneficial to all of us for quite a long time now. Mm, thank you. Uh, we've got a few questions in here that have come in, and sorry for jumping all over the place, but we're, we have, uh, okay. <laughs> there are a, lo a lot of questions to get through. Um, how does the US intend to help the effects of climate change in the Indo-Pacific region? We have had quite a few questions here about climate change. Yeah, look, I, you know, I, I think we all have to be um, deeply concerned, much of the science that's come in recently around uh, ocean warming, about uh, uh, acidity in the oceans, around uh, you know aberrant weather patterns in the United States and elsewhere, is a clarion call that effects that we thought were going to happen in 30 or 50 years are happening now. 
And so the urgency is profound. I must say, one of the people that inspire me the most is our Secretary Kerry and the people that are working assiduously on COP26. I think we have to up our ambitions considerably. There's a recognition that just setting goals for 2050 is not sufficient, that we need to take much more ambitious goals for 2030. That requires weaning us, uh, I think, first and foremost from coal. I, I will say, I think the United States, other countries are taking important steps. We're going to need China. Uh, China has talked a good game, frankly, on climate change, but they are by far and away the biggest burden of coal. By some measures, they're contributing more than 50% to global emissions as we speak. They are going to have to take steps urgently now, not just in 15 or 20 or 30 years, but to address the uh, important and critical demands of addressing climate change. The Pacific Island nations face a myriad of challenges. Low-lying na uh, nations face existential questions. I'm actually very grateful for some of the hard work New Zealand has done there. Um, clearly, uh, some uh, mitigation strategies, other things are going to be important as we go forward. I would say that um, uh, what you've heard from President Biden and our team reflects that both at the first stage of the climate summit, what we will see later this year at the G20 and then at the COP26, is a determined, ambitious American effort to help lead the global community towards ambitious goals that can and will be met to keep uh, global uh, temperatures within a range that is sustainable uh, as we go forward. But I would simply say that the evidence that is accumulating should be alarming to all of us, any of us who have any interests in sort of how we, the kind of planet that we hand to our children must understand that among all the issues that we are addressing, um, this issue is, uh, uh, takes privacy. Mm. Uh, another question here, how would you say uh, the United States approach to encouraging the strength and growth of democracy has developed since earlier efforts from the 1970s? Oh, it's such a good question and it's a painful one for us because although we are going to do what we can to host some sort of gathering of democracies, I don't think that there can be any doubt that across Latin America, parts of Africa, in the United States and in, uh, in ASEAN and elsewhere, uh, uh, democracies are facing enormous pressure. Uh, uh, the United States has experienced uh, an upheaval on January 6th. We see ongoing efforts to restrict voting. Um, we have enormous domestic divisions that concern us more generally. So I would say that um, President Biden talks a lot about a time where we, we have to demonstrate the viability and the effectiveness of, of democracies um, and that we can get things done. Again, I hope you won't, you'll excuse me for playing to the audience here, but we look at what your prime minister has done in a number of crises. And frankly, it's a model of how a modern Democrat and uh, visionary leader should lead. Uh, and we seek to try to do what we can in the United States, but we have to approach this effort in a, in a manner in which we are humble. And we re realize that democracy is fragile and it's, you know, we, it can't be taken for granted. Each generation has to pay its own price to, to uh, reinvigorate it. We are facing more challenges than ever before. So not only do we want to talk to other countries about champion a model that we still think is the best, we look to those countries to inspire and help us. And no country has done that better or more than New Zealand, to be frank. Thank you. There's a question here around Australia's view of New Zealand's uh, defence spend. And the question is, Australia is often very critical of New Zealand's low defence spend. What is the US's view? I don't think Australia is critical of New Zealand. I, I occasionally a little aside, but I think the partnership between Canberra and Wellington is actually quite strong. Uh, uh, look, all uh, countries uh, struggle with arriving at the right uh, uh, measurement for uh, the security picture. 
Um, I think we've had very strong discussions with New Zealand about the way forward, things that they're thinking about in terms of investments and the like. Um, countries can always do more, but I will say, as we look at the last uh, uh, challenges that we've faced in Afghanistan and elsewhere, the country that has been there to support us has been uh, a leading partner, has been New Zealand and its special forces. Um, I'm grateful for the role that New Zealand plays across the board, not just in a narrow security realm, but diplomatically, trade, economically, all the things that we've been discussing. I know that occasionally there is the friendly, fraternal engagement between Australia and New Zealand, but I assume that most of it is quite good nature. Mm. Speaking with the, the defence theme, what role would the US see New Zealand defence and security apparatus play on regional security challenges? Thank you. I, look, where we look for New Zealand leadership is a stronger role in the Pacific. Um, we believe that that's going to be critical going forward, maintaining, um, you know, uh, oversight of uh, key fishing areas, uh, engagement, security engagement with partners in the Pacific, occasional efforts at peacekeeping and the like, working within um, uh, multilateral groupings. We believe New Zealand has a critical role to play in UN peacekeeping as it always has. Uh, we'd like to see New Zealand play a role in some maritime uh, engagements more directly and just uh, uh, active engagement in multilateral fora where the United States plays a leading role. So I, look, I, I see New Zealand playing a very positive role. Uh, I think if anything, I'd like to see the United States and New Zealand more actively engaged across the board, including on the security uh, side uh, in the Pacific. That would be my ambition for the next five to 10 years. And frankly, the country that needs to do more here is probably not New Zealand, but the United States. Mm. Um, there's a question here about political polarization, uh, which uh, we, we here in New Zealand see as being a, a huge problem uh, in the US. Uh, the question specifically is, how will the Biden administration pass a form of a price on carbon? Uh, are you confident the U.S. can pass this uh, to combat climate change? So I'm going to answer the first part of the question. The second part, uh, in terms of the, um, the strategies for dealing with climate change, I'm going to lead to our lead climate negotiator and our teams. They are busy engaged in what are the best practices for dealing with both um, you know, uh, restricting carbon emissions and, and how we best uh, deal with strategies to combat climate change. But I will talk about the larger questions of political division inside the United States. President Biden in our system came up through the Senate. Um, it had a key defining role for him as a young man. Most or many of his good friends in the Senate were Republicans. He's maintained those relationships. He insists to us that as we talk about the Asia Pacific, about the Indo Pacific, and about China, to work across the aisle. Uh, he's deeply committed to bipartisanship. You see that in his attempt to work with Republicans on infrastructure more generally. Although our country is fractious and divided, I believe deep down most Americans, most Americans, would prefer to work together and understand that the challenges are so deep and so profound that they require us uh, working constructively. But I am under no illusions about the challenges of multiculturalism in the United States, not multiculturalism, but people who resist that or have concerns about what that means, issues of income inequality, accumulation of wealth, uh, uh, lack of access to health care, of, uh, of uh, deeply uh, unfair uh, circumstances in terms of jobs and uh, other social services. Those are things that the United States has to address. I think you'll see uh, ambitious efforts on the part of the president uh, over a sustained period. You see some of that. He gave a major speech today on voting in, in Philadelphia, which in many respects is the heart of our democracy in which he said that the central feature that separates us from so many others is the ability and the ambition 
and the desire to vote. Remember, in our country for a long period of time, a huge segment of our population, uh, people of color, were not allowed to vote. People fought and died for that, and to have it be taken away cavalierly is antithetical to everything that we believe. And so, you know, this is a challenge that, that, that is enormous, but it is one that the president and his team are seized by. Thank you. Um, moving on in terms of our geography, there's a question here that says, how do you see the role of India change in the midst of present and emerging regional issues? Look, I would say that of all the countries in the Indo-Pacific, we're probably most ambitious about the partnership between the United States and India. It's a complicated relationship. Uh, there, are, We've had uh, periods in the past where it's been hard to find uh, common cause. What we have seen are deeper engagements between our countries, a recognition of India's uh, critical uh, strategic responsibilities uh, and our shared alignment on uh, many issues. You will have seen that in recent uh, weeks uh, and months, uh, India initially was hit very, very hard by COVID. Uh, the United States tried to help uh, convene international efforts, certainly uh, domestically, bringing together business and other groups to support India in its time of need. Um, I believe that ultimately uh, uh, the partnership between the United States and India uh, will be very close over time, but we will overcome some of the histories of the non-aligned and worries of, you know, entrapment, all those things that have uh, basically bedeviled previous generations of strategists and diplomats. And ultimately, um, we are destined to work close to, uh, closely together. I also believe that the what we are seeing in many respects is a reorientation of Indian foreign policy and strategic perspective outside of its more narrowly defined region and more towards the Asia Pacific arena that New Zealand and the United States are more engaged and comfortable in. And I think both New Zealand and the United States welcome that active participation and uh, vision on the part of Indian friends. Thank you very much, Kit. There are still lots of questions here, um, but I am mindful of time and that we are holding everyone up. Um, from morning tea uh, here in, in Wellington. But one last question that we can close off on, and I'm guessing here that it's come from one of the students, about a third of our delegates are uh, tertiary students. And the question is, what do you admire most about New Zealand? <laughs> that's, that's really a good question. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if I would say there's any one thing. I, I, I admire uh, the way that New Zealand um, is attempting to um, uh, engage and bring together uh, uh, indigenous populations uh, into your dominant culture. Uh, I admire your outward stance that you're focused on the world, that you understand the importance of engagement with the world. Uh, I admire that you're an outdoor rugged people that love sport um, and that you're good at it. Um, I admire your prowess uh, on the rugby field or uh, on a sailing ship. Uh, I, uh, I like the fact that you're prepared for mateship or friendship, um, and that uh, you tend to try to take countries at their best and, and recognize the positive things that they bring to bear. And, you know, I think there's a sense of adventure and almost mysticism associated with, with a lot of things that New Zealand brings to the world. Um, my best vacations, my best engagements, some of my best friends uh, are there. Um, I, I, so I, I'd love to be able to say there was any one thing, but you know, it's one of the few places, I, I, I think the highest compliment I can give is that I think over the last year or so, and I don't want to be political, but we had our own political challenges and we were facing COVID. I remember we'd get together with friends and sometimes one of us would just say, you know, I'm going to move to New Zealand. 
And it was never anywhere else. It was always New Zealand. And I always take that as a, as a great compliment. So I, I'll, I'll use that as my fair to well. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be with you today. And I, I am grateful for the partnership and uh, extraordinarily appreciative of the role that New Zealand plays uh, both as a model and as a partner. So thank you for allowing me to join you this morning. Have a good rest of the conference. I'll look forward to hopefully engaging many of you in, individually or the org organization as we go forward. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Kurt. To add to your list, we also admire our ability to get other people to tell us how much they admire us. <laughs> um, on behalf of all the conference delegates, thank you so much for your time and, and your very, you're very, <laughs> your very useful uh, and, and frank insights. Um, the US is a friend right. and uh, it's great, great to have had you um, with us today. And thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thanks, Herman. Thank you. Uh, now, for the rest of the conference, we're going to be splitting into two sessions.